Я очень рад приветствовать вас сегодня здесь. И а, я говорил уже и говорю о том, что чувствуется вот братская любовь. Мы очень рады. Сравнительно недавно познакомились с вашим а, пастором, но чувствуется братская братское тепло, любовь, и у нас была возможность принять ваш, вашу группу прославления у нас в церкви. И спасибо, что вы даете привилегию участвовать здесь сегодня вместе с вами. И действительно, наш Бог, Бог чудес. Если россиянин из Москвы может говорить на мове, да, то это уже почти чудо. Поэтому я, я начинаю вот пару слов. Бог даст еще несколько слов выучу к концу сегодняшнего дня. Да, спасибо, брат. Хорошо. Друзья, вы понимаете по-русски, по Нет. А по-английски? Do you prefer Russian or English? Okay, who prefers English? Who prefers Russian? Who prefers Ukrainian that I don't speak? All right, so that's not going to work. So we're going to stick with English today, all right? Is that okay with you guys? Say yes if that's okay. All right, awesome. So, so um, I, will, I just wanted to thank you for, for being here today. Just, it's a real privilege and joy, and, and, and joy for me to be here. And again, this is a reminder of how we're one church, regardless of where we meet, what time we meet, what city we meet, whether it's in Washington, Oregon, or California, we're one church, we're one body of Christ. Amen? Are you asleep? Amen? Do you believe that? All right, awesome. So what I wanted to share with you today is I wanted to, I understand that the, the first sermon of your service is geared towards kids in English, but I wanted to share some things that I think are going to be equally applicable to kids, to youth, to young adults, and those who have been in faith for many, many decades already. And so there will be a test at the end as well, so be ready, okay? You guys like tests? I don't like tests, no, me neither, but there might be one at the end. So I want to start with a question. How many of you love broccoli? Raise your hand. How many of you hate broccoli? Yes, I'm with you guys. I'm with you. I, I, I have a confession to make. I don't like broccoli. I know your parents don't want me telling you this right now, but I don't like broccoli. I hate it. I, I hate the way it tastes. I hate the way it looks. I really don't like it. I know it's good for me. In fact, my kids tell me it's really good for me. My wife tells me it's really good for me. My parents told me it was really good for me. I just don't like broccoli. I don't like that green stuff on my plate. It takes too much space from my steak and potatoes, so I don't like that. And over 17 years of age, uh, of uh, 17 years of being married with my wife, she now stopped asking me to eat broccoli. She just puts it on my plate and she expects me to eat that stuff. And so you know what I do? I put on my heroic face of a martyr, of somebody who is dying for his faith, and I eat that broccoli with this face of going through a tremendous tragedy. I do it because I know I have to do it. I don't like it. I don't enjoy it. I don't love it. I just do it because my wife makes me do it. Now let me ask you this. What if instead of saying, eat this broccoli, what, what you have heard instead is, love that broccoli. Enjoy it. Eat it with joy. Eat, savor all the texture of that broccoli. Just really, really enjoy it. I think what you would find is that that's a whole separate level of commitment there. Whole several, whole different level of relationship. Love it. Enjoy it. Instead of just chewing it, instead of just swallowing it, now I have to have some sort of deeper level of connection with it. And I pray that God would change my taste buds so that it doesn't taste like rubber to me anymore, right? That's what I would have to do. So the question that I want you to answer today is this. What does Pastor Vasily's uh, eat vegetable preferences have to do with the sermon today? And what I want to tell you is that your Christian walk, your walk with Jesus, many times looks like I am eating broccoli. You're doing it because it's good for you. You're doing it because you have to. But you may not love it. Some of you are involved in ministry because that's expected. Some of you are here today at this service because people are going to think weird things if you don't show up for a while. Some of you are going through the motions today. You're chewing it. You're swallowing it. But you don't love it. Broccoli happens in real life. 
But what happens is that God is not just asking you to do a bunch of things. He's not just giving you a list of rules and a list of things to keep. He's asking you to love Him and as a result of that love to do all the things that He's asking you to do. Not the other way around. We don't prove our love for God by going through the motions and doing all these things. We actually love God and love people and out of that we want to be obedient to him and we do what it is that he wants us to do because most of all he wants us to love him with all of our hearts you see it's not a matter of going to a church service it's a matter of going to worship at a church service it's not about not committing a murder it's about loving your enemy it's not a matter of sacrificial even giving and financing things. It's a matter of recognizing God's place in your life before all. You see, the problem is sometimes we do all those good things, but we do it the way I eat broccoli. Mechanically, because I have to, because it's good for me, but I don't love it. And so today I want each of us to examine our hearts and really kind of take a look and say, how am I, what, what am I doing as a follower of Jesus that may have become mechanical in my life, that may have become automatic, something that I am going through the motions. And there is a problem, and that's what I want to talk about today, is I want to talk about a problem, and then I want to talk about a solution. So today's message, kids, pay attention, there will be a test at the end, right? There is a problem, and there is a solution. There is a what? A problem and then there is a what all right so we got that established you passed the first test there is a problem and there is a solution and the problem is this that the nature of human heart is evil is sinful is messed up that's the problem the problem is that none of us here is capable of perfectly following God's law it is impossible and God, in His love and grace and mercy, He gives us the solution. He gives us that answer. He gives us the promise, and that promise is Jesus Christ. That solution is Jesus Christ. That promise was fulfilled on the cross through His sacrifice, through His substitutionary death on the cross. And so we're going to talk about those two things. Some of you may know that I served in the military for four years. And when you're in the military, you, on, when you're on duty, you wear these dog tags. You wear these metal plates around your neck. And um, that way, you know, if you're wounded in battle or if you're killed, they can take those metal plates and they can report in. And on that metal plate, there is a, uh, your name is written on there, your title is written on there, or your rank, uh, your social security number so that they don't make a mistake and misidentify you. And then you got your religious preference, Christian, Baptist, uh, or Catholic, whatever. And then there is a, a blood type on there. So mine is A negative. So if I need a blood transfusion, that's what it is. My question is this. Kids, who knows? Why do you think it is engraved in metal? Why would somebody take something and engrave it in metal instead of writing it in a pencil? What do you think? Go ahead. Yeah, that's a smart kid right there. If you write it in pencil, it would be washed off. You wouldn't be able to read it anymore. But when it's etched, when it's engraved, when it's printed in metal, it is permanent. It cannot be erased. It's there. And so when we look at the book of Jeremiah, when we look at the chapter 17, the first 10 verses, we see a very interesting thing is happening to the people of Israel. People of Israel are in trouble. They're in trouble economically, they're in trouble militarily, they're surrounded by the Assyrians, they're surrounded by the Egyptians, they have strong armies, and they want to attack and they want to destroy this country. They want to attack and destroy the people of Israel. And so Judah looks at all of these nations, they look outside, and they're scared, they're threatened, they're afraid to be wiped out. We do that. We look for threats from the outside. 
We are naturally, instinctively just looking to the outside for threats. When we have kids and we're walking down the street, as a parent, you see the car is moving. Okay, I got to keep them away from the road. Oh, there is some, some you know, snow falling from the roof or some icicles. I know I got to step away from there. You keep an eye on those things. You are scanning for threats. That's what you and I do. That's why you and I lock doors at houses at night. Who here locks their door to their house at night? Be honest now. Who does not? Who doesn't understand English or Russian? <laughs> All right. There's a few of you. We lock our doors. Why do we do that? Because there are threats outside that we don't want to come in into our house. We, keep, we want to keep that stuff out. That's why the smaller countries look at bigger countries and they're threatened. That's why bigger countries are thinking we can, we can get those taken care of. We can attack. We build walls. We build castles. We lock our doors. We're trying to keep what's outside out from what's inside. But guess what God tells us through his prophet Jeremiah? When these people are looking to their threats on the outside, what God tells them is that the problem is not on the outside. The problem is actually on the inside. And so if you would open your Bibles to Jeremiah 17, verses 1 through 4. Jeremiah 17, 1 through 4. The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron. Kids, have you ever seen a pen of iron before? Okay, think about it. Pen of iron. If you have never seen one before, go home and ask your parents to buy you one. Tell them Pastor Vasily said it's okay. And what's more important, it has a point of diamond. Ask for that version. They're going to love it. Point of diamond is engraved on the tablet of their heart and on the horns of their altars while their children remember their altars and their asherim beside every green tree and on the high hills and the mountains in the open country. Your wealth and all your treasures I will give for spoil as the price of your high places for sin throughout all your territory. What this is saying here is this. God is saying, listen, you have a heart and on that heart, with a pen of iron, with a diamond tip, something is written. And that something is sin. What it says here is that the problem is on the inside. The problem is in the heart. And it is engraved. It is not just written with a pencil. It is engraved with an iron pen of, of, of diamond tip on, on a stone-like heart. That cannot be erased. What this is really saying is that sin is not an action. Sin is a condition. We are not good people who have good nature that occasionally sin, who occasionally screw up. We are sinners. We're sinful people whose hearts are imprinted with our sin in a permanent way, who occasionally get out of it and try to do good things and try to imitate God. That is our condition. And so because of that condition, we sin, not the other way around. And that's what God tells the people of Israel through his prophet Jeremiah. The problem is really bad. But the problem is not Egypt. The problem is not the Assyrians. The problem is not whatever the blank is in your life. The problem is not in the tiny nation of Judah. The problem is in your heart written with a pen of iron, with a diamond tip. Wow. Isn't that just like us? When we have a problem, when we have a difficulty, when we have a conflict in our life, what happens? We try to look for threats. We look for those issues outside, don't we? It's not me. It's my wife. It's not me. It's my husband. It's not me. It's my family. It's not me. It's my pastor. It's my minister leader. It's not me. It's my, my city, my state, my government. It's something else. And all of those threats are going to come in from the outside, and they're going to try to attack and destroy what's on the inside, when in reality, the biggest problem is on our heart. The problem is on the inside. That is what we should be looking for at first now your heart that is engraved is not going to change just because you tie the church 
your heart is not going to change because you gave 20 bucks to a homeless guy on the way to church. Your heart is not going to change because all of a sudden you were nice for one week or you stopped doing whatever it is that you were doing for a couple of weeks and trying to keep clean. It's not going to get clean because of that. It's not going to change because of that. What it, it's engraved. You've got to understand it's a permanent condition. And so the question then is, if sin is not a, 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 an action, if sin is a condition, what has to happen? Well, very simple. You have to get a new heart. You have to get a heart transplant. The whole heart needs to be replaced. That's what has to happen. And that's, that's the only thing that can fix it. Because whenever we turn away from God, whenever we follow our engraved heart, God takes all of those things out of our lives. All the good things that He has, He wants His children to have. Because our heart is engraved with sin. And that's what our nature is telling us. Do what feels good. Do what's, what you think is right. It's all relative. But that's not the truth. That's not the truth. Our hearts are engraved. And instead of trusting our feelings and emotions, we must trust God. So that's the problem. The problem is our sinful condition. The problem is that our heart is engraved. So what's the solution? Well, there is good news. And that good news is the good news. It is the gospel. Because now there is a new covenant. There is a new deal. There is a new promise that was fulfilled through Jesus Christ. And Jeremiah reveals this prophecy to his people. And he's saying there is going to be something that is actually going to deal with that problem of your engraved heart. The new covenant. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? New creation. He's a new being. The old one has passed away. Behold, the new has come. What this is saying is that if you are in Christ, if you, Jesus has died for you, if you've accepted that sacrifice, if you've decided to follow him, what happens is he's doing a heart transplant on you. He's taking your old being, your old heart, and he doesn't just, you know, correct it a little bit. He doesn't try to erase it a little bit. He takes that old heart and he throws it away and he takes a new heart and puts it in you. A new being, a new nature, something that is not engraved by sin, but something that is a new home for the power of the Holy Spirit living inside. Our God, if you really think about it, is the most amazing surgeon who is doing heart transplants all the time. Jeremiah 31, 30, uh, 31 verses 31 through 33. It says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. That new covenant is Jesus. And he says that for this covenant I will make the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. So he takes that new heart and God himself writes his laws, his principles, his attitude towards sin. And so when you're sinning, if you're a, new, if you're a believer, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have something that tells you that's messed up and it's wrong and don't do it. And that something is your conscience through the power of the Holy Spirit because your heart has the new law upon it. You're a new being. Unfortunately, we, just like the people of Israel, often reject that message. Why? Lord, I don't need a new heart. I just want to have prosperity so I can buy the stuff I need. I want to have a strong military so that this country can defend itself. I want to have a big house so I can lock the doors and keep the threats from the outside away. I know what I need. And so you and I look at God not as an amazing creator of the universe. We look at God as a vending machine. Now, kids, do you know what a vending machine is? Yeah, what is it? What's a vending machine? Tell me. Yeah. And what do you put in it? Money, right? So you come up to a vending machine and you put a few quarters in and it spits out like a Diet Coke or some candy or a Snickers bar, whatever it is, right? 
That's how you and I treat God. Lord, I go to church, I did this, I serve, I do that. Therefore, give me the stuff I'm asking for. Let me put a few more quarters in. Maybe that wasn't enough last Sunday, let me pop some more in. It doesn't work like that. Let's be honest. When you pray, how often do you ask God for stuff? And how often do you ask Him to change your heart? You'd have to raise your hand. But answer honestly, what do you do more of? Asking Him for things? Nothing wrong with that. We're His kids. We want to ask for things. And as a loving Father, He gives it to us. But do we really ask for a change of heart? Are we asking for that engraving to be gone? Are we asking for a new heart towards a person who irritates us? Towards a spouse that is still doing things that they shouldn't be doing. Towards a brother, a father, or a mother, or a ministry worker, whatever it is. Do you ask for a changed heart? Not of theirs, but yours. Because there is something inside of that person that Jesus was willing to die for. Beneath whatever it is that drives you crazy, there is something in there that our God... The creator of the universe, Jesus was willing to die for. And so, friends, I would encourage you, when you pray, don't just ask for things, but ask for God to change your heart. Because just like the people of Israel, our problems are often starting from within, not from the outside. Jeremiah's message was from God. God knew the root of our problem. He knew where it was coming from, and it goes straight to the heart. And 1 Peter 1, verses 18 through 21 says this, Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your fathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last time for the sake of you. You know what this means? Jesus was never the plan B. Jesus was never the backup plan. God didn't just give you or give all of us the Old Testament and said, let's see how this tries out, or works out. Why don't you try, see if you can do it, and if it doesn't work, then I'll send my son. Jesus was never plan B. He was known from the very beginning as the answer to yours and my condition of the heart. And he was made manifest in those days later. He became known. He was revealed to us. And our faith and hope are in God. The new covenant, the new deal, the new promise, the new testament is not a new deal to God. That was always the plan. The gospel, the good news, has never been about there is heaven and hell, and so choose Jesus to avoid hell. The gospel was always a message that you and I have a sinful condition that is engraved permanently on our heart. And the only way to fix that is to have a heart replacement through Jesus. And that's why you and I are a new creation. Not in bondage of sin. Not with that engraving. Are we still broken? Yes. Are we still messed up? Yes. Do we still sin? Yes. But that's not a condition anymore. Our heart is different. We react to sin different because we have a new master. We have a new God who is, who is driving everything that we're doing. And then our behavior changes. Then our obedience comes from love from God. Whoever believes and accepts Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior will get what? What will they get? Easy life in heaven? Your pastor was saying, I don't know what, the, what, what it's going to be like in eternity earlier, right? But what are you going to do? Easy life? Flying on the clouds all day long and listening to harp music like they portray in cartoons sometimes? Are you going to be relaxing, walking on the streets of gold? Immortality, happiness, no disease, no death. Is that what you're looking for? I'll tell you what the end result of that is. It is being in the presence of Jesus for eternity. And so the question I have for you today is when you think of eternity, are you looking forward to Jesus being there? Is that what's attracting you there? 
or is it a bunch of other stuff? And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I would encourage all of you to look forward to eternity, look into Jesus, and recognize that without Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, all you're doing is behavior modification. You're still a sinful creature in a state of sinful condition with a heart that's engraved permanently trying to do good things. And that the only way to do that, the only way to fix that truly is to have a heart transplant that is only made possible through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Do you believe that? Say amen if you believe that. Our God is great, isn't he? He's an incredible surgeon. Did you know that God was a surgeon? He's a heart replacement surgeon. And I pray that if there is anybody here today who has not had that surgery yet, I would encourage you to get it done. To turn to Jesus, accept his gift to you, and your life, your nature will change forever. Amen?